At exactly 11.15 a.m. on Saturday morning of July the 27th, 1985, Marshall Music started playing on Radio Uganda and hours later, a voice came on announcing that then-President Dr. Apollo Milton Obote had been overthrown. This marked the end of his reign as President of Uganda, starting his journey into exile where he died 20 years later. New Vision TV interviewed his former bodyguard, Deo Semakula, not real names, to reconstruct Obote's last day as president. Semakula, who was a member of the airline inner security under the presidential escort services, preferred to remain anonymous because he is now a public servant. Semakula recalls the morning of July the 27th, 1985, after Obote held his last meeting as president of Uganda. On Friday evening, inside the president's office at Parliamentary Building, a meeting was taking place discussing how to counter the force that was marching from Gulu to attack Kampala. Lieutenant Kano Ogole assured the meeting that the renegade force would be blocked between Luwelo and Nakasongola. The war in Luwelo and defeat of Obote soldiers by a rebel force led by Yoweri Museveni had caused tribal tensions. Obote and the chief of staff, Brigadier Smith Opon Achak, were Langi, while the chief of defense forces and commander of the 4th Division based in Gulu, General Tito Okello and Major General Basilio Alala Okello, respectively, were Acholis. Obote also told the meeting that Zambia government had accepted to send troops to help. A plane loaded with uniforms and military equipment had arrived at Entebbe Airport that Friday. The soldiers, to elude detection, were to arrive in a separate plane at 12 p.m. the next day, July the 27th. However, they did not land as planned as by 11 a.m. Basilia's forces had overrun Kampala. At night on July the 26th, the vice president, Paolo Mwanga, rang the president and advised him to leave Kampala for his safety. Obote's inner security had also been informed. Obote had retired to his suit in Nile Martians, present Serena Hotel, after a long day. It was at 2 a.m. when we got information the pro Obote soldiers who had laid the ambush had surrendered and joined the advancing force. Oh, my dear, Obote responded, throwing his hands in the air, when I informed him about the developments and told him we were leaving Nile Martians. We then drove him to Dr. Henry Opiate's home at Impala Avenue, Kololo, at 2.45 a.m. Obote told some of his ministers and top security officials who had assembled, I am not going to move again. I fought I mean, I do not want to fight again. I'm going to die here. Eventually, a decision was made that Obote leaves for Jinja as the army tried to contain the situation. So he was told that he was being evacuated to Jinja and would stay at the Nightill guest house near Ripon Falls Hotel. We left Dr. Opiate's house at 4.30 a.m. in five cars as the advance Bazir force reached the outskirts of Kampala. I sat in the lead car from where I would work out the route. Though Obote thought about Jinja, I was planning to go past. The first roadblock the motorcade ran into was in Mukono. Who are you? The soldier shouted. No one is going to escape. We shall all die here. Who are you? The soldier insisted. I told him my name. As luck would have it, the soldier knew me. Since I was neither a Choli nor a Langi, he allowed us to proceed. I assured the soldier the president had asked us to pick his wife, Mama Miria Obote, who was traveling by road from Nairobi. At 5 a.m., soldiers from the Gaddafi barracks were taking position at the Owen Falls Dam and we slipped through using the story of picking Mama Miria. At the Ginger Roundabout, I notified Obote that we were heading to Kenya. Oh, my dear, was Obote's reply. My worry was soldiers from Magamaga barracks blocking the Ginger Tororo Road. But we cruised past with no incident. Instead of using the main road, I opted to take the Majanji route. Somewhere, Obote asked to be allowed to ease his bladder in the bushes, and we made a brief stop. All of us were silent. By 6 a.m., we were at Busia border. At the border post, the man who had been deployed to guard the gate had disappeared with the keys, and the exit gate was locked with a padlock. 
A soldier tried to block us, but we overpowered him and crossed into Kenya. Before we crossed, we left the uniforms and guns on the Ugandan side because we were entering another country. Kenyan security had already been alerted and the Kenya Busia District Commissioner received us. We were driven to Teacher's Hotel in Busia for rest before proceeding to a state lodge in Kakamega. However, we had run out of fuel. We had not prepared for this long journey. Thank God I had 250 US dollars which I had saved from a trip to Ethiopia and Dr. Opiote had 100 US dollars which we used to buy fuel. Obote, lost in his own world, had no coin. He was broke. Obote turned to me, calling me by name and said, Thank you for saving my life. I can't pay you, but the people of Uganda will. This sounded like a final farewell. A new life awaited me. The only hope we had was crushed moments later when we learned that the chief of staff, Brigadier Smith Opon Achak, and Lieutenant Kano Ogole had landed at Embakasi military base in Kenya. We had hoped the two would lead loyal forces to put up some resistance. Obote stayed in Kenya and eventually relocated to Zambia, where I later joined him. Years later, I returned to Uganda and joined the civil service.